Hello, good afternoon. I'm so pleased that you are joining us today. Welcome to this Engaging the Mind program. My name is Susan Lynch. I am the Associate Director of Lifetime Learning at the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. I want to thank our colleagues in the UVA's Environmental Institute for partnering with us today. For starting the program, I want to bring a few things to your attention. We received many questions in advance of the program. If you have a question during the presentation, you may enter it in the webinar Q&A at the bottom of the screen. You'll find resources in the webinar chat. Please also note this program is being recorded. It will be posted in Lifetime Learning's podcast library in about a week or two. Now onto the program. I'll introduce our moderator and then she will introduce the rest of our speakers. Karen McLathery is the Cheryl J. Aston Chaired Professor in Environmental Sciences in the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia and the Director of the Environmental Institute at UVA. She's an expert in coastal resilience and climate change and has led large interdisciplinary research teams for over 20 years with a focus on the Eastern Shore of Virginia. McLathery is a member of numerous boards including the Governor's Coastal Resilience Technical Advisory Committee and the Advisory Council for Virginia Sea Grants. In, 19, in 2019, she was elected to the College of Arts and Sciences Society of Fellows. So thank you again for joining us for this Lifetime Learning Program. Now I'll turn the program over to Professor McGlathery. Professor, I invite you to start the presentation. Thank you very much, Susan. Well, welcome everyone to our panel on extreme events and a changing climate. Uh, today we'll be talking with faculty experts from UVA about the relationship between extreme events and climate change, the impacts this has on communities and what can be done uh, in the economic and policy realms to lessen those impacts. I'm guessing that most, if not all of us have experienced, have personal experience with extreme events, whether it's storm and flooding or a heat wave or an extended drought. In fact, globally, 85%, 85% of the world's population has experienced some kind of extreme weather event. And we find that this is most intense in developing countries. And so uh, about over the last 50 years, um, these extreme events have caused over 2 million deaths and $4 trillion worth of damage. 2022 was a year where the United States experienced a lot of extreme events. Um, in uh, 2022, there were 18 disasters that cost over $165 billion of damage. So this is a real problem that we are dealing with, all of us, every day. So a decade ago, it was uh, difficult for scientists to link extreme weather events to climate um, that is happening at a global scale. But over the last decade, there have been huge leaps forward in what we call attribution science. And that's our ability to link climate change to extreme weather events. And we'll hear about that from one of our panelists today. We'll also hear about um, how we can take this knowledge of extreme events and connect it with um, helping to inform choices that we're making to manage risks now and in the future for both people and, uh, and for property. So I'm really excited um, for, this, um, for this event today. And I'm going to now introduce our three panelists. Um, the way the program will work is you'll hear introductory remarks from each of the three panelists, and then we'll all be on screen and we'll be available to answer the questions uh, that you have. Some of them have been posted in advance of the meeting. Others, as, as Susan mentioned, you're welcome to put in the chat and we will get to as many as we can. So first we'll hear from Kathleen Skiro. Kathleen is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Sciences here at UVA. She is a climate scientist who studies clouds, convection, and precipitation in the changing climate. Um, her work combines field measurements, satellite observations, and climate modeling to better understand how climate warming affects rainfall and storms. Um, following her will be Jonathan Colmer. Jonathan is also an assistant professor. He's in the Department of Economics. And he's also co-founder and director of the Environmental Inequality Lab. 
Jonathan is an environmental economist who also works in the area of growth and development economics. His research combines data with insights from economic theory and environmental science to better understand how economic activity and environment and the environment uh, influence each other. And then we'll hear from Elizabeth Andrews. Elizabeth is the inaugural practitioner fellow of UVA's Environmental Institute. Uh, she is a longtime legal and policy expert in Virginia who has worked with state government and nonprofits and universities for decades. I've had the pleasure of working with her very closely. Um, and before coming to UVA as our practitioner fellow for this year, Elizabeth was director of uh, the Virginia Coastal Policy Center at William & Mary. So as you can see, we have three very diverse perspectives on what is a very challenging um, issue that we are facing, and we're excited uh, about the conversation that we will have today. So I am now going to invite Kathleen to share her screen and start with her presentation. So it's my pleasure to be here to um, introduce some of the science on extreme weather events and a changing environment. And um, I'd like to start with just an executive summary from climate assessment reports. Um, so the first bullet being that emissions of greenhouse gases from human activities are responsible for approximately 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming since 1850 to 1900 as the pre-industrial baseline. Um, and averaged over about the next 20 years, global temperature is expected to reach or exceed one and a half degrees Celsius of warming. So the reason we're all here um, is because climate change from a human caused rise in greenhouse gases, as is illustrated in the top right here, this is an, a steady increase in carbon dioxide concentration from the 1950s when we started observing this um, to present day. And then this is a reconstruction out uh, back 800,000 years um, from, from ice cores, the carbon dioxide concentration within orange, the present day levels. Um, amended on the right part of the graph. And so you can see that the, the carbon dioxide concentrations are, are exceeding 420 parts per million today. And these human caused rise in greenhouse gas, um, greenhouse gases is increasing the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. So how do we know that human influence has warmed the climate um, at this unprecedented rate in at least the last 200, uh, 2000 years, which is shown in the left here where this is a temperature reconstruction and the observations meant in the right. Um, well, we have great tools called climate models um, as one line of evidence that can clearly attribute the increase in global temperatures, which is shown in the black here, um, to greenhouse gas emissions. So the way we know that, for instance, is um, in the orange shading here. This is an ensemble of climate model simulations that are run. Um, there are as many as 50 climate modeling centers and models that participate in these large assessment reports. And that's what the envelope here is showing that the, the difference in, in the representation of, of present climate by those models. Um, only models that include the effects of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions can reproduce the increase in global temperatures that have been observed. If you do not include anthropogenic emissions, which is shown in the green here, you do not simulate observed increases in global average surface temperature. Um, so that's one example of attribution science with climate models um, that is simply done to illustrate the effects of anthropogenic warming on global surface temperatures. So a lot of what I'll talk about is coming from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in particular, the working group one of that report, which was um, the latest was re released in 2021. Um, this is a report that addresses uh, the most updated physical understanding of the climate system and climate change. And it really combines multiple lines of evidence from paleoclimate observations, process understanding, as well as global and regional climate simulations into a really nice assessment. And this is a really large effort. It's, uh, for instance, this one, um, recent report is 234 authors from 66 countries, over 14,000 cited references, and a total of 78,000 expert government um, review comments. So it's a tremendous effort, and there's a lot of great uh, synthesis of the literature within these reports that come out roughly every five years. Um, so since we're talking about extreme weather, um, definitions from the IPCC on an extreme weather event is that uh, it's an event that is rare at a particular place and time of year. Changes in extremes uh, are usually examined from two perspectives. They're either focusing on changes in frequency of extremes or changes in the intensity of the extremes. And it's important to note that all extreme events have multiple causes. Um, an extreme event attribution determines whether man-made global warming was one of them. 
So how is this generally done? It's generally done in um, two ways. The first is splitting the historical record into two or more time periods and testing for statistically significant differences in extreme events between earlier periods where you have a weaker global warming influence and recent periods where um, the influence is stronger. And uh, the second way is running climate models with and without the influence of greenhouse gases uh, to see how events would be different with and without um, the influence of greenhouse gases. So as Karen mentioned, um, attribution studies have greatly improved in recent years. And what I mean by that is they've, for one, become more coordinated. So um, different thresholds for defining extremes, for instance, uh, are more coordinated among different um, uh, groups and they're more comprehensive in the sense that in previous um, attribution studies, maybe only one way of attributing an extreme event, uh, the influence of climate change on extreme event would be used, but now there are multiple um, ways in which that's done. And they're also increasingly done in the immediate aftermath of an extreme event. And I think that's particularly important work because it helps to bring um, to the public's attention, the influence, the potential influence of climate change on individual events um, and their extreme, their extremes. So some trends that have already been seen in the historical period, emphasis on have already been seen and continue to be seen with greater confidence as we project into the future, increased intensity and frequency of heat waves, the increased intensity and frequency of heavy precipitation, um, an increased proportion of intense tropical cyclones, and an increased drought in some regions. Um, and we have different confidence in different uh, types of events. So I'll just give a brief overview of why, for instance, um, some events are more difficult than others to attribute to anthropogenic warming. So in the previous slide, I mentioned, for instance, um, extreme heat. So temperature extremes are, we have more confidence in those types of extremes and drought and extreme rainfall. And that's largely because we understand the physics of those events um, better than we understand the physics of, for instance, smaller scale space and time scale events like severe conductive storms, which is uh, one aspect of my research. Um, and so the quality of the observational record also matters a lot in terms of our confidence in attribution um, of different extreme events to uh, climate change. And um, the ability of models to simulate a given type of extreme event. Uh, so again, using severe convect convective storms as an example, um, those are some of the events that models uh, don't do as well at in terms of representing um, processes. So we're generally um, quite confident in some of the existing literature surrounding changes to extreme heat, droughts, and extreme rainfall, because we understand the physics and certain changes in tropical cyclones, like the most intense um, tropical cyclones increasing and um, other events like changes in severe convective storms, um, even flooding instances uh, are less certain in, in both present and future climate. But if I'd like you to take one thing away, it's that extremes are already more extreme. And um, if you'd like to learn more about this, beyond what we'll discuss today, I encourage you to, especially if you're interested in extremes for the United States, look at the National Climate Assessment. Um, a new report should be coming out shortly. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Assessment Report 6 is the latest version, and um, worldweatherattribution.org is an excellent resource if you're interested in specifics related to extreme event attribution, and if you're interested in whether or not a given event that you've seen, for instance, in the news is can be um, attributed in some way to our changing climate. So um, that's all for me for now. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Jonathan to discuss uh, the economic side of things. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you, Kathleen. And uh, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to speak with you all about the economics of, uh, of extreme weather and climate change. OK, so um, I'm an economist, unapologetically. Uh, and uh, economics fundamentally is, is about trade-offs, right? And so what do I mean by this? What I mean is that in short, you know, we're making choices every day uh, with scarce resources, whether those resources are time, uh, money, the amount of energy we have uh, based on how much sleep we got, right? And some of these choices are big uh, and some of those choices are small, right? Individuals and households uh, are choosing where to live and where to work, how much to work uh, and how to spend the money that they earn. Uh, and then, you know, you have firms making choices about uh, what they're going to produce, uh, who they're going to hire, what investments they're going to make and how they're going to produce. And then governments 
are making choices uh, about how to regulate, uh, how to tax and how to spend uh, the tax revenue that they have. Like, should they spend it on healthcare? Should they spend more money on education? Uh, and so all of these considerations uh, are important to think about. And, uh, and climate change uh, is no different. Um, we can make choices uh, about whether to make costly investments uh, to reduce emissions uh, with the uh, expectation that that will reduce future damages. Uh, we can make costly investment decisions to do nothing. Uh, we can make decisions to do nothing about mitigation and instead make costly investment decisions to reduce the consequences of, of, of events when they happen through adaptation. Uh, and we can do nothing at all uh, and instead choose to spend that money uh, today on other things like health or education. And what this plot basically shows is that uh, we've already actually done quite a bit. So the current uh, policies that governments around the world implement uh, have us on track for about 2.5 to, to 3 degrees of warming, uh, which is uh, a far uh, better outcome than uh, absent any kind of climate action. Uh, so I think that's sort of a one starting point that, that we have made uh, progress in this space. But the, this uh, sort of action that we have made is far away from uh, some of the numbers that you hear in the mainstream media regarding sort of where we ought to be uh, sort of getting towards either to try and limit two degrees or, or 1.5 degrees of warming. And so uh, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on extreme weather. Uh, uh, and as Kathleen uh, uh, mentioned, uh, we uh, our ability to attribute uh, extreme weather to climate change uh, has improved substantially over the uh, last sort of decade or so, uh, and uh, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, so, you know, the way that I think about extreme weather events, right, is that, you know, climate is what you expect uh, and weather is what you get. Uh, and so with a, a changing climate, we expect uh, and are already experiencing uh, that hot days uh, are getting hotter and are becoming more frequent. So uh, Kathleen mentioned the World Weather Attribution uh, site. Uh, their um, recent research from the July 2023 heat wave in North America found that it was virtually impossible uh, that it would have happened absent uh, sort of the anthropogenic contribution to, to, to greenhouse gas emissions uh, and would have been two degrees cooler, uh, two degrees Celsius, sorry, uh, absent, uh, uh, absent uh, sort of our contributions uh, to carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, one of the more notable uh, heat waves uh, in, in sort of US history, however, happened uh, quite a while ago, back in 1995 in Chicago. Um, and this happened between July 12th and July 15th. Uh, and uh, it resulted in, in sort of one of the most uh, costly, deathly uh, heat waves uh, in, in, in US history, uh, which killed 739 people uh, over five days. Uh, temperatures were experienced uh, of above 118 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and the majority of the victims were elderly, uh, poor, and, and black. And so this sort of shows that the, uh, you know, that the, these these salient events can have uh, just devastating consequences. Um, the question is, though, you know, the extent to which you know this type of evidence happens more generally. These events are very salient, uh, but what might be the sort of contribution? Uh, of weather to uh, patterns of mortality more generally. Um, so I, I as uh, as was uh, stated up front, I'm, I'm the director of the Environmental Inequality Lab, and, and what we do uh, is to work with very large data sets uh, to try and better understand the extent, uh, the causes, and the consequences uh, of environmental inequality in the United States and around the world. Uh, and so I'm just going to share with you some of the work we've been doing recently to try and understand uh, the sort of mortality effects of extreme heat. So what we see uh, is that on hot days, so again, sorry for the uh, the Celsius reference here, but a day above 90 degrees compared to a day above 70 degrees uh, is associated with an additional uh, sort of two uh, deaths per 100,000 uh, people per, people over the age of 65. So this is using data, uh, individual level data on the population of the United States over 20 years. Uh, and we're looking at the effect of uh, daily temperature on mortality in the following three days. So this, the data that's underlying this is about 2.3 trillion observations. So we're providing sort of comprehensive and systematic evidence on, on the effects of hot days. Uh, it doesn't just happen uh, to, it's not just elderly people though who experience this. We see that more adults die on hot days at a lower absolute rate uh, and even children under the age of five experience 
uh, a much significant increase uh, in, in mortality on hot days. Um, so this is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we have these salient heat wave events, but but even an individual day above uh, above 90 degrees uh, has health consequences um, on, on our population, and that's uh, today. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to understand here in, in terms of getting at the distributional consequences of this, how, how these, these effects are, are, are distributed throughout the population, is that we know where you live affects exposure. So the urban heat island effect is this idea that in areas with more imperviousness, uh, surfaces, pavement, uh, rather than trees, the, the temperatures are, surface temperatures are substantially higher. Uh, and so where you live affects your experience of, of heat. Uh, this is Albemarle County in Charlottesville. So some data here on imperviousness, tree canopy cover, and summer surface temperatures. Uh, and we see sort of a consistent spatial pattern here where the areas with greater uh, pavement coverings uh, experience much higher temperatures. And even within Charlottesville itself, we see uh, that there are higher temperatures uh, in areas with fewer trees and greater uh, sort of concrete and, and pavement coverings. Uh, and so where you live affects exposure, uh, but also who you are affects exposure based on where you live. Uh, so we see that uh, black individuals within a, within an, in, within a city, uh, this yellow bar here, experience about uh, three degrees Fahrenheit higher temperatures than, uh, than white individuals. Uh, and this is true across other race groups and ethnicity groups as well. Um, and further, that at every percentile of the income distribution, this is true. At every percentile of the income distribution, whether you're rich or you're poor, we see that black individuals are exposed to much higher temperatures uh, than, than white individuals. Uh, and so this tells us that, you know, your exposure to heat is going to depend on your income, but also on your race and ethnicity. Uh, based on the uh, sort of the options and the choices you have uh, to where you live. Um, and what we see is that the effects of temperature a day above 90 degrees on the likelihood of mortality is substantially higher uh, in areas that are more impervious. So they have more concrete and pavement, fewer trees. Um, so the baseline was a two, uh, an additional two deaths per 100,000 people for the over 65 population. If you live in the most impervious places in the United States, um, an additional day above 30 degrees increases that rate to eight. Um, and we showed that this is also higher for black individuals compared to white individuals and that 50% of that difference can be explained by imperviousness. So, um, the sort of take homes uh, for this, this isn't the cheeriest of, uh, of presentations, but um, the kind of main take home I want you to, to, to leave with is, you know, that there are consequences to everything that we do uh, or don't do. Um, we have to think very carefully about the options available to us and make informed decisions. And that's where uh, academics uh, play a role in providing uh, systematic and comprehensive evidence on these issues. Um, but it's also important to think about the distributional consequences. Um, and finally, given the, the slightly less uh, sort of upbeat uh, nature of the presentation, I think there are good reasons to be hopeful. Uh, for example, since 1960, the mortality effects of hot days have declined by 75%, uh, largely driven by uh, sort of adaptation uh, investments, air conditioning, uh, early warning systems, how we communicate information about extreme heat. So whilst there are still uh, mortality consequences, they're much uh, diminished than what they used to be. Uh, and then, as I noted in the first slide, we have made uh, sort of non-trivial progress in reducing emissions, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Now that you've heard from the scientist and the economist, and we're all frightened, uh, I get to bring it home with talking about what can we do about all of this? What are some law and policy responses that we can have in our communities to make them more resilient? The first thing we have to do is recognize that there are some real, some valid challenges that our communities are facing as they try to develop more resilient policies. For one thing, we're facing multiple risks at once. That's expensive and it's frightening and it's hard to figure out which way to turn first. Heat is an important factor. I call it the heat doom loop, that the hotter it gets, the more air conditioning we use, the more we create carbon emissions, the more we increase the heat, the more air conditioning we need, et cetera. Um, election cycles are short in the United States, and it takes a lot of political will to have politicians look at uh, 
risks and factors that stretch out into the future. Um, and especially because um, things become more uncertain the further out the future we look. So it's very, it doesn't lend itself to looking at a long-term thing like climate change and extreme events increasing. Um, same thing with regulatory oversight. There is uncertainty in governments about their obligations at times, and particularly as these events become more common, when does it become foreseeable? Funding um, and the difficult choices that go along with it. There's not enough money to save and to protect everything. And so we're gonna have to make some very tough choices. Um, and all of that adds up to a lot of challenges for local governments. However, it's also a time um, of good opportunity, I would argue right now. We have a more mobile workforce than we've ever had before because of hybrid and remote work. People don't have to be tied to the same spot for their jobs. We can envision some other communities. We have aging post-World War II GI Bill housing that is being replaced in many communities. It gives us an opportunity to revisit as well. Increasing focus on climate change and increased funding coming down from the federal government right now, all of which adds up to a good time to rethink our priorities. What do we want to build? How do we want to build it? And where? And these photos show you some examples of choices that have been made to raise up homes above the flood risk, for example. The market's going to catch up to the risk. Note the for sale sign saying, did not flood. That was after a 2016 flood event in Louisiana. But what do we do to make our communities more resilient? Um, we have to think about the future. We're not very good at that. It's full of uncertainty and we have a lot of distractions today. I love this quote from Kurt Vonnegut that brings that home that we need to start planning for the communities we want in the future. So what are some good options? Well, we have to look at things really in three categories, new development, already developed areas and undeveloped lands. Um, for new development, planning, as I just mentioned, is key. Um, we have to make sure that we don't price our lower income residents out of safe housing on higher land in flood prone areas, for example. Um, we need to make sure the whole of the communities involved in the planning, that they have a voice at the table, um, adopting standards for our new development so that we have stricter building codes, for example, with a higher base flood elevation standard, with um, more heat resistant materials, um, reduced impervious cover requirements. Jonathan was just talking about impervious cover and its effect on heat. It also increases flooding from stormwater, uh, from storm events. So, you know, having requirements to reduce to cap that impervious cover can be another important tool. And then restricting development in highly flood prone areas, for example, or even highly wildfire prone areas. We need to think about that because as tough as that is, it's a lot easier to stop it ahead of time than to deal with it when it's already there. And that leads me to what do you do with already developed lands? Really, it's three choices. You can either armor or adapt, accommodate, um, or you can abandon. And for most communities, it's gonna be a blending of all of those. Um, for armoring, you can have seawalls and levees, but you can also have some of the new technology around artificial oyster reefs as breakwaters that provide some habitat too. And for accommodation or adaptation, you can have things like elevating the homes, like I showed you in the first slide. That's not though gonna last forever because the road is going to flood to the point where you're not gonna be able to use that eventually and your elderly and disabled residents can't access those homes when the electricity's out and the elevator doesn't work, but it can be a stopgap measure. So you don't have an economic crash and burn in the community. Um, same thing with septic systems when the soil no longer perk due to uh, groundwater levels rising and flooding, you can have some elevated septic systems. And also uh, again, the impervious cover caps so that you have more pervious cover to have the water sink in. And for abandonment, you can have a choice of things. There are buyout programs that are voluntary, such as New Jersey's Blue Acres program, where they approach homeowners in a very flood prone area and offer to buy out the homes and then convert that parcel to green space as a flood buffer for the community. Um, some uh, researchers are talking about an innovative approach where you could maybe buy out the home from a family and let them rent back like a life estate kind of concept and that gives them some income to relocate when the risk gets too great and get them out of the hazardous area. Or uh, communities are considering sometimes buying out and renting back as holiday B&Bs until again, the threat gets too great. Uh, rolling easements are a, a legal tool that's interesting that as our shoreline moves because of flood waters and sea level rise rising, um, 
that also a line moves where we don't allow construction and shoreline protection past that line on the seaward side. So it gets people out of the way of the hazard and it also puts people on notice that this is an area that's at risk and subject to flooding. And then finally, um, requiring disclosure of flooding history at the time when a house is sold or septic system failure when a house is sold is a great way to raise the red flag for a purchaser before they buy in an area that's subject to hazards. Um, all of those can be tools that a, a community can bring to bear. For undeveloped lands, again, it goes back to planning, looking at the data, figuring out which areas are most at risk for flooding, for example, and then setting aside undeveloped areas where you could have a flood buffer, just like you can set aside undeveloped areas as a buffer from your communities for wildfire risk as well. Um, and also that way you can provide a path for upland migration of wetlands, which serve an important role as flood buffers, but also as shoreline stabilization to prevent our shores from being eroded in high water events. So there, and, and establishing buffers around communities of undeveloped land, it's really important. For all of these, I can't stress enough how important trees are. Um, Jonathan just talked about the urban heat island effect and um, trees can help with that. Trees help with shade, they help with flood buffers, they help with carbon sequestration, habitat, they serve many purposes. So planning for having trees in our communities is key. So I'd like to end with a little note of hope, which unfortunately is not often talked about in the media with climate change, but research and technology are bringing us gifts all the time. And uh, at the University of Virginia, the Environmental Institute, they're funding quite a few interesting research projects surrounding technologies to help us with our adaptation to these extreme weather events and climate change. Education is one of the most important things. And I know that, you know, as a, as a professor, that I would be one of the ones to, to tout education, but you have to learn your risk. We, too often in our society today, we have the, the five minute read. But if we actually research the risk for our properties and our communities and talk to our neighbors about it and talk to our elected officials in our local community, then we can make some change. You can pick one or two of those policies that I just talked about and really drive that point home among your neighbors and your elected officials to try to educate everyone and just trigger the conversation in your community. Um, another thing that's important is the whole of the community being engaged, the grassroots engagement in these planning efforts. We have an interesting project here at the University of Virginia at the Institute for Engagement and Negotiation. It's called the RAFT, the Resilience Adaptation Feasibility Tool. It's a partnership with two other universities in Virginia, and we work with local governments and try to help them to be more resilient by assisting them to develop a list of actions that they want to undertake. It's community driven. They want to undertake to become more resilient, and then we connect them to university and state agency resources to achieve those items on their list. I'm happy to share more information about that with, if anyone wants it. And then finally, funding. As I mentioned, we have some funding coming down right now from the federal government, but um, we need to make sure that's sustained and that we have planned ahead so that we use it wisely and can create the communities that we want that are more resilient. Thank you. Um, so we have a number of questions from the audience. Um, I had wanted to start with one question um, for you, Kathleen. One, uh, there's sort of a two-part question. One actually came in as you were speaking. I think it might be clarification. Um, and I want to ask a related question from the audience. So when you say that extreme events are more extreme, the question is, what is the time period that you're looking at? Are we looking at decadal, century, millennial, could you put some context on that? And then I'll have a follow-up question. Yeah, so um, generally statements are uh, with respect to a pre-industrial baseline period. So something like um, what I was quoting was from 1850 to 1900, some sort of baseline average, um, and then attributing a present day period. So somewhere in the like 2000 to 2020 or some some larger uh, present period. That's normally how um, the attribution studies are done in the historical period. Yeah, great. Um, and then the follow up question was related um, to how climate affects storms. So there was a question from the audience about, um, you know, if we think about Hurricane Harvey that, for example, that hit Texas in 2017 and dumped 60 inches of rain in a few days, that was really an epic storm and very unusual. Um, well, we thought at that time it was very extreme and it's become more of the norm. Um, 
And the attribution studies have said that that kind of storm is three times more likely to happen because of climate change. So the question from the, from the audience was like, how do we, what is the effect of warming, atmospheric warming on storms? How does it affect a storm? Yeah, well, um, when the surface temperatures rise, um, the moisture content in the atmosphere also rises. That's a relationship called the clausius clapeyron relationship. And so there's more moisture to condense and precipitate out. Um, and so that's the basic thermodynamic response um, of why, for instance, heavy precipitation is increasing and why we have confidence in that increase. And that's true for um, hurricanes. Um, that's true for more severe convective events as well. Um, and so that, that we have generally decent confidence in. Um, but then there are also things like, for instance, translation speeds of hurricanes that are um, potentially tending to uh, decrease. And so if a storm is sitting over an area for a longer period of time, then that region is not only receiving greater intensity of precipitation, but also more um, in total. So um, in, in that particular event, and that's um, specifically how the increase in precipitation is, is felt. Right. So storms can move more slowly and they can stall and they just dump a lot more rain in one particular area. Okay. And that can result in both inland flooding as well as coastal flooding in a storm like that. Certainly. Okay. Yes. Um, there was another question here about um, kind of related both to what you, Jonathan, and you, Elizabeth, were talking about. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, this question is about um, climate justice. So it's about in areas in cities, for example, or along the coast uh, where people are disproportionately exposed to heat or flooding. Um, and how do we, you know, how do we address that aspect of it where it's both the, it's the exposure and it's the vulnerability um, from an economic perspective and from a policy, you know, what kind of tools are available to do that? Jonathan, do you want to start and then? Yeah, yeah. No, happy, happy to start. So, you know, it's an, it's an incredibly important uh, question. And I, I think that the honest answer is that, you know, I don't know. Uh, and I'm an academic, uh, so I spend most of my time looking in the rearview mirror, trying to un understand uh, what has been and, and, and build evidence. I think we have, in theory, reasonable ideas of what could work and what might not work. But in practice, uh, it will take experimentation and, and trial and error. Um, and that's the hard job that policymakers have that academics don't. We get to say, I don't know. Uh, that's why we do research. If we knew the answers, we would be out of a job. Um, but yeah, so I, I think there's there's a number of things that that we have, uh, I think, evidence on that could work, but it's going to depend on a on a on a location by location uh, uh, basis. It's not going to be a sort of one size fits all solution, but. Um, I think sort of part of the, the challenge that we see in many cases is that sort of individual economic circumstances, uh, what economists, what you might think economists would uh, put the weight on for why people live in given locations or make the choices that they make, uh, seem to explain only a small share of, uh, of sort of the exposures that people experience. And, and time and time again in our studies, we see that there are sort of broader factors um, especially in the United States, we see that sort of where people live in terms of the imperviousness of their neighborhoods is driven far more by uh, zoning policies uh, and sort of the historical legacy uh, of, of racist zoning practices in the United States as well, which uh, shape the neighborhoods that uh, Black and other minority uh, groups have access to. It's not the case that everyone has access to the same neighborhood. So um, that seems to be more important in, in driving our results. Um, but again, time and time again, we also see that, that low income uh, individuals are more disproportionately affected by events when they happen. Uh, and so more work to understand how and why uh, this is the case and the sort of policy levers that we can uh, implement to uh, or pull to, to try and reduce that, I think is, is, is important, um, necessary. And I'll just chime in and uh, a couple of notes on that. Um... I want to reiterate what Jonathan said about the legacy of uh, past policies impacting today our most vulnerable citizens and who is exposed to things like the urban heat island effect 
who is exposed to environmental hazards. Um, we bear that that legacy today. And the first thing we need to do is recognize that across the board and make sure that our zoning policies, our environmental policies, all of our land use um, policies and laws, take that into account. Um, one thing, for example, um, that can also be addressed is the cost benefit analysis that's used in our federal funding programs. Uh, the Corps of Engineers uses one, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, they use different cost benefit analyses and that has tended to benefit in the past the, the higher valued properties, right? We spent a lot of our dollars over the years um, armoring up resort areas, for example, right? Things that can, um, that can pass that cost benefit analysis. So revisiting some of our policies with a different lens and, and figuring out how to make it more equitable is a, is a good start. And um, making sure that when we do undergo, for example, tree planting programs, just to bring it to a very simple level, um, to provide more sh shade from the heat, make sure that that's done equitably with the community engaged in, in the way that they would like to see it done. And uh, because you know, planting trees also means increased maintenance, and there's been some pushback because of that from some communities. So doing things in partnership with the community, making sure we have the right lens when we're looking at this and we're considering equity in all of our decision-making, that's a great start. Elizabeth, can you follow up? There's a comment that came in just now on insurance policies and reinsurance companies um, uh, in areas where some people may be leaving like in California, Florida. Right. So, um, I like to say that the market has to catch up to the risk um, in the sense that we can still flip properties on low lying parcels that are subject to flooding, right? That has not quite caught up. Um, and part of that is because things change quickly. Um, part of that is that no one wants to be left holding the bag with a property that, that floods too much to sell anymore, right? I get that. Um, but we have started to see the needle move with the insurance industry they are pursuing modeling more, not just relying on past storm events, but modeling uh, about storm events and taking a closer look at property values and comps um, when they're looking at insurance. Uh, there have been cases uh, in Florida and Louisiana of insurance companies not renewing policies and because it's just too much of a lift financially. So I think we're beginning to see that. And that feeds right back into the point I was trying to make about planning. We can wait till the market catches up to the entire risk um, and insurance policies aren't issued anymore for certain areas. Um, and there's a fear of what they call blue lining in mortgages where uh, mortgage banks might draw a line around an entire area and say, we're not going to issue mortgages there anymore. Your house might be on a hillock and not flooding, but we don't care because the roads are flooding and your neighbors are flooding and we're not gonna issue mortgages there anymore. So and we can, Wait till that happens, or we can try to plan ahead and find safe landing for the people that live in those communities and assist that. So planning, I, I, I hate to keep banging that drum, but it's key because we can either let events just overtake us or we can plan for them and make sure that we have an equitable response. Kathleen, I had a related question for you in this conversation. Um, a lot of what we're talking about is sort of action at the local and regional scale level. And I'm wondering as a climate scientist, do we, are we good at sort of downscaling our models? So taking these global models and scaling them down to give us some sense of conditions now and in the future at that level, at that sort of community-based level, whether it's a regional community or a local community in order to help in some of these planning decisions and other kinds of decisions, or is that a gap we have to fill? We're certainly getting better at it, um, and I think it's it's always something we're going to have to continue to get better at in terms of um, choosing which climate models, for instance, um, better represent the types of events in certain regions that we're interested in, um, and being more careful about how to um, address some of the uncertainties in doing that. Um, but I do think that the dynamical downscaling efforts um, 
which is basically running a core, uh, really high resolution model um, over a region of interest have, have gotten to be um, really useful um, for certain types of studies. So, um, and some statistical uh, approaches as well. So work to be done, but I, I think that it's a really promising area. And I think that used correctly, um, projections can be really useful. Thanks. Um, I have a question for all three of you, and that's about um, early warning of extreme events. I mean, it, it it's obvious that if there's early warning and people can get out or can protect themselves or their property, that the risk is less and the damages are less. And I know that, what was it, in 2003, there was an extreme heat event in Europe, Western Europe, and that ushered in this um, sort of heat health warning action plan. But there must be other things like that that you could talk about in terms of the role, the capacity for early warning or figuring out ways to um, prepare people for extreme events and what 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 that means from your different perspectives. Uh, I don't know, Jonathan, do you want to start? Sure, yeah. No, so, I mean, uh, certainly uh, it's the case that uh, as as Elizabeth was saying, you know, planning is is important, and the more information that people have, uh, the better choices uh, and decisions they're better able to make to manage the the consequences of these events. Like, uh, if it's a complete surprise and you have a flash flood, then of course you're less able to do something than if you've been given advance warning and are able to, you know, move whatever furniture you have upstairs or, or put some sandbags down. I mean, there might not be a lot you can do, um, but in the policy space as well, there's been you know research. To, to suggest that sort of providing uh, upfront guarantees uh, of access to credit for damages and rebuilding uh, rather than having to wait until after the fact has been uh, very effective in reducing displacement and also uh, reducing the economic uh, costs uh, of these events. So I think there's you know a lot to be said for, for early warning and, uh, and advanced planning in this space. Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? Um... I want to note that it's difficult to have early warning for these um, rain bomb events. These and and Kathleen you will be the pro on this, but I just know from personal experience. I have family down in Louisiana that experienced that uh, unnamed storm event. The Weather Channel wasn't there; nobody saw it coming. It just was a rainstorm that hovered for five days. And the reason I say it's hard to warn about is that they had they experienced flooding both from overflowing rivers and from the overwhelmed stormwater infrastructure. So it's very hard to have an alert to that. I would say instead, you have to make sure that you are building out your stormwater infrastructure to handle um, the predicted storms as well as just the past history storms, right? Look at the predictive data. Um, you have to decide what range your community is comfortable with but making sure the stormwater infrastructure is in place and the riverine flooding control measures are in place before these events happen is the best way to handle those. Um, I do want to add on to this that I noticed, I was just trying to look quickly through these questions and they were talking about the uh, lack of political will for sacrificing at the individual level. You know, it does, it takes political will for a community and the individuals to be prepared for these things to prioritize them as well as to reduce our carbon footprints. And um, it's very hard to adjust our expectations for what we want our communities to spend money on, right? We all want the beautiful schools and the top roads and the best public safety measures and there's not endless money. And so I, I hear what you're saying to the person who wrote that in there that it does take political will to prioritize measures that we put in place in our communities for the what ifs right? For the, we know it's coming, but we don't know when or how severe. That That's a very difficult thing to prioritize, but we have to start that discussion in our communities. Kathleen, did you have anything to add to the conversation about the early warning and what the models can do in that context? I, I would love more early warning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, uh, and I think that there are, there are certain events that are easier to warn. So for instance, seasonal drought, 
um, related to um, major modes of climate variability like an El Nino, um, those are much easier to warn for than, um, and even hurricane forecasting uh, has gotten pretty good. Those are those are events that are easier to warn for than um, events like uh, Elizabeth was describing. And um, so I appreciate that there is inherent predictability in the system that can predict certain certain extremes. Um, and for others, it's it's much more challenging. Kathleen, you mentioned El Nino. I wonder if you could, um, because that is something that happens cyclically in our Earth system and it affects climate extremes. Could you talk a little bit about what an El Nino is? We're currently in an El Nino year and how that relates, could be related to what we're seeing in terms of climate extremes or, or weather extremes. Yeah, yeah. So El Nino is um, also related to extremes and um, both El Nino and La Nina cycles can be related to uh, sort of opposite extremes, uh, depending on where you are. And as Karen was mentioning, we're in an El Nino right now since June, um, and that's set to continue until spring of 2024. Um, so El Nino is just a brief overview. It's a periodic climate signal um, where there's warming in the tropical Eastern Pacific, Central and Eastern Pacific. And that sort of gets communicated to the rest of the atmosphere where the, the atmosphere as a whole global average temperatures increase. Um, and actually this year is really interesting because there's never been an El Nino, at least not um, since the beginning of the observational record um, that's happened also at a time when global average surface temperatures and, and ocean temperatures are at record highs. Um, so the effects of El Nino and that cycle increasing global temperatures is sort of compounding the, the increase in global temperatures that uh, are due to, to global warming. Um, and so there are different types of extremes that can result from El Nino, depending on where you live. Um, and so, for instance, El Nino actually typically decreases the frequency of hurricanes, Atlantic hurricanes. Um, and this isn't a typical El Nino year because we also have anomalously warm Atlantic surface temperatures. So for those that have been asking questions about hurricanes, um, the this year we, I think are at 19 named storms. The average is about 14. Um, and so actually we're, we're more in like the normal range if not the higher end of normal, um, even though it's an El Nino year because we, we have those anomalous increases in sea surface temperatures. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, when El Nino can actually mute extremes, uh, sometimes global warming can compensate for that and just keep things around normal. Um, but yes, so El Nino increase in global temperatures would also increase the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. And so flooding potential in various regions where um, weather patterns would change to be more um, uh, precipitating more than normal. Um, that is, of course, it's amplified under, under warming as well. So in, in short, El Nino is responsible for um, wet and dry extremes as well. Um, and for instance, in the Western United States, uh, like Southern California, El Nino, traditional El Nino, textbook El Nino, um, though every event is different, says that there's you know, landslides, flooding, lots of precipitation in the western part, and also in the, the southeastern and Gulf states. But in the northern part of the United States, it's usually warmer and, and drier. Um, and I'm focusing on the US because we're, we're here in the US now. So those are just a few examples of um, extremes that El Nino can produce or dampen in the case of Atlantic hurricanes. Um, and La Nina is what can increase um, hurricane frequency. And so for instance, like in 2020, when we were in an El Nino, we had a, a record 30 storms um, and 21 storms in 2021. So those are just a few examples. And then on top of that, we have warming, uh, global warming that is, is amplifying those, those extreme patterns. Thanks. So we have just a few minutes left and I thought that there have been a number of questions from the audience about what can we do? What can I do? What can my community do to be, to adapt or be more resilient to extreme events? Um, and so I wanted to pose that question to you, but I want to put a filter on it. I want you to think about um, where are you optimistic from your perspective that certain actions can um, be productive and helpful in terms of dealing with climate extremes? 
weather extremes, and you literally have one minute each. So, Jonathan, go. <laughs> well, so I, I think this is a really hard, uh, hard question um, to answer because uh, at the end of the day, like our individual actions, uh, what we do, if our own emissions individually went down to zero, that wouldn't change anything. Um, now that doesn't mean we can't do anything, um, but I, I think sort of if you were to push me on on where I think uh, individual action can be most productive, I would say that you know the political economy of the climate change problem is such that there are huge amounts of lobbying resources that go into uh, fossil fuels and aspects on that, and so uh, if one was going to spend the money that they spend on their carbon offset for their flight that probably isn't doing anything and instead were to support uh, climate action groups to sort of balance the scales in climate lobbying, I think that would have a uh, much Thanks. larger. Yeah, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, one minute. <laughs> I think that lobbying at the federal government level is important, as you said, uh, Jonathan, but uh, for example, the, there's a climate change act that the UK has had since 2008. We don't have a national one. Um, but there's a lot to be done at the state and the local level. Uh, there was a lot of um, publicity about a case in Montana where the youth sued the state um, for having a requirement in their Environmental Policy Act that said that you couldn't take climate change impacts into account in your environmental impact state uh, analysis. And the court said that was unconstitutional based on the state constitution. And so not every state has those constitutional provisions. So focusing on your state and what does it provide is important. And then starting this discussion in your local community about look at the risks, look at the risks for your community. There are great resources that have been shared in the, in the chat. Look yep. at the risk for your community and start the discussion. Thanks, and Kathleen, just very briefly, thanks. This is just a tangential comment that um, I, one, potential positive consequence of these extreme events and and um, hearing about them more publicly and how they're, they're just impossible to ignore now. And um, I think that uh, one positive from that is that uh, people are starting to recognize that these changes are happening and happening in their backyards and we really need to take action. Um, and so I'm sad that more ex extremes are more extreme already and, and we're seeing these, but I, I think that um, it's helping everyone to wake up. Thanks very much. And I just want to put a footnote though on that, that I'm encouraged by the um, ability of research to understand these extreme events and their link to our actions. Um, and that means if we understand it, there's something we can do about it. So I'm going to pass on to Susan Lynch. I want to thank you all for being here um, to end the program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, to each of our esteemed panelists and to our colleagues at UVA's Environmental Institute for partnering on today's program. Uh, this is such an important topic and I appreciate our panelists uh, speaking to climate concerns from this interdisciplinary approach. So I wanna thank each of our panelists for sharing their knowledge and expertise with UVA's alumni, friends and families. I wanna take a moment and bring an upcoming Lifetime Learning program to your attention. On Monday, October 23rd, Lifetime Learning is hosting a virtual event entitled Strokes from Risk Factors to Recovery. Dr. Nakresha Roach and nurse practitioner Carrie Johnson will discuss how they and a team of clinicians and researchers in the UVA Stroke Division provide care and support to patients and their families as they navigate life after a stroke. So you can sign up for this program and others at our website at engagement.virginia.edu forward slash learn. Please also consider visiting our website to check out other lifetime learning programs, the vodcast library, our thoughts from the long blogs, and our UVA Speaks podcast series to read, watch, and listen to our expert UVA faculty. So thank you again for joining us for this hour of learning, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.